Hi, welcome to Into ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Scott Allison, and he's going to tell us about his near death experience. Hi, Scott. Hi. Now, where are you? Mm. What state are you in? I'm in Wyoming. Okay. Yep. All righty. So uh, feel free to start wherever you like and take as long as you like. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my story really starts, it's a culmination of just my life in general. Um, I like to say the comparison is that poem, uh, Footprints in the Sand. Um, that's really how I've come to realize all the things that have happened to me. And that's also how I got a better relationship with, uh, with God. And uh, so I heard this quote and it was, you know, we live life forward, but understand it backwards. <clears throat> and that's exactly what really resonated with me, um, with, with God. And so I would say I, I started, so I was born in, uh, in Sungnam Providence, South Korea. <clears throat> and I was born to uh, parents that were very poor. Um, I don't know much about them. Uh, I just know that my mother ran away very often and uh, she would leave me with, with my dad. And it just happened for a couple of years actually. And then when I was three and a half, she left for good and she didn't come back. And so my dad didn't know what to do. And uh, I guess they work in a factory. And so he put me up um, at this foster home slash adoption agency with Holt International. <clears throat> and uh, he just thought that, you know, I would have a better opportunity there than, than with him. And so when I was four, I was, I was in this foster home in South Korea. And I, I don't remember a lot, but um, that was when my parents from Wyoming who are, they're Caucasian and they have a son, a biological son, <clears throat> and they adopted me. And so I, I came over to the States uh, when I was four and I met my new mom in Denver. And that's really my first solid memory is getting off the plane and I'm with my translator and she's telling me that, you know, this is my new mom. And uh, I just, I, I just broke down because it didn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> And uh, so we live in a small town named Powell, Wyoming, and it's like 6,000 people. And that's where we lived. And it was a pretty normal family. And so I was getting adjusted, um, you know, learning the language, uh, learning the culture and everything was completely different. And um, I remember my, my parents, they they seemed to get along pretty well. And it, it just seemed like a real comfortable transition i'd say and so for the next year uh things were things were pretty good and i started bonding with my brother and and uh you know i i caught on very fast and i was just a normal kid <clears throat> and i should say my my dad at that time he was uh he was a judge and he was a lawyer and my mom was a stay-at-home mom and around the time i was five they started they start arguing a little bit and it was something that my brother and i hadn't really seen before but it just progressed to like a, a very extreme level and my dad would threaten to take my mom to jail and so we didn't understand what it was that was going on but my brother and i would hide in the closet because they would just i mean they would get it i mean and it was scary. And so immediately my position was, I thought it was my fault because I, I kind of joined the family at this time. And then a year later, they're nonstop fighting and abuse. And it, I mean, I just thought it was my fault. Uh, within the year, uh, they divorced <clears throat> and it put my brother and I in a position where we had to basically pick a side. And that made it even harder because we'd stay at my mom's or my dad and, and they'd be, you know, talking bad about each other. 
And so we didn't really know what to do. Um, when my dad left, he said that he would take my brother and then that my mom could have me. And so right then was kind of the first <clears throat> real rejection that I felt. Um, my mom said, absolutely not. You know, you need to keep them together. And so my dad took me to, and uh, we, we lived in the same town as my mom. Uh, we stayed in Powell, just right across the tracks. And <clears throat> so my mom had custody of us on Tuesdays and every other weekend and summers. And, and my dad had us the rest of the time. Um, after the divorce, my mom had, she had a mental breakdown and, um, it got really bad. She would, I mean, she would just scream at us. Uh, we'd come over, you know, for a visit and it was just hours, if not days of just yelling at us and it was misplaced aggression. <clears throat> and back then of course we didn't understand but she you know she was so angry at my dad um she would look at us and, and and just kind of blame us and i remember her saying things like you know you're gonna grow up to be chauvinist pigs just like your your father <clears throat> and and mind you we're six and seven at the time and my mom she didn't have a very good life um you know she grew up in new york and she there's sexual abuse and mental abuse there as well. And so all of that kind of came out and we were the targets. And so we really avoided going to my mom's house because it was, it was horrible. Christmases were, she hated Christmas. Um, she would actually have us do chores on Christmas um, and there'd be no presents. And so we just, we kind of just stayed away as much as possible. Um, my dad, you know, he was a judge and lawyer, so he was never home. Uh, he was always at work. Uh, we ended up having a, a housekeeper that took care of us for most of the time. <clears throat> and so this is the living arrangement um, for the rest of for the rest of my life, pretty much. I mean, um, it was, it was a bunch of mixed emotions and, as I started getting older, um, about nine years old, I started acting out a little bit. And it started with real small things like taking change from uh, my dad's dresser or, uh, you know, stealing stuff from my brother. And <clears throat> it just it just kept progressing. And I was starting to steal bigger things like I uh, I was writing checks at like age nine so i was forging checks and and i was stealing from stores and i was just acting out and i didn't really understand why um my parents didn't either and they just didn't really know what to do with me and and so um by age 12 i was being babysat by a family friends family and i just decided to start looking through their stuff and i found like twelve hundred dollars in cash and i took it and i remember i just i just started buying stuff and i started giving people money um and obviously they found out about it they confronted my my dad about it and they wanted to press charges and so my dad not really knowing what to do he just decided that he was going to put me in a group home <clears throat> on a on a 30-day crisis bed and so I remember that day, uh, he was just, I came home and he just told me to pack my stuff. He said, pack your stuff, you're leaving. So I, I, I said, okay. So I packed my stuff and they dropped me off at this group home that's like 15 miles out of Powell. Um, and this is my first experience leaving home. Um, so I was terrified. And there's about 15 other uh, juvenile delinquents there um, and being in Powell it's so small I, I'm the only Asian kid there and that's pretty much my you know my whole childhood is I'm the only Asian person around so I got bullied just non-stop uh, it was non-stop um, these kids just picked on me relentlessly 
And so 30 days, I'm thinking, okay, I can do this 30 days and I'll go home. Uh, well, 30 days go by and uh, my parents don't come get me. And so after 30 days, uh, you become a ward of the state. And so that's what happened is I ended up becoming a ward of the state. Um, I had a social worker and that 30 days I was supposed to be there turned into two years. And so I was in that group home for two years. Um, my parents did not want me back. Um, and I was really angry by that. Uh, I saw kids come in and leave and their parents would come and get them. And, and I just got left there. And I was every, in a group I remember home. every month as a teenager, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Every month we would have these meetings called MDT meetings and it'd be me and the social workers and my parents and the school. And we would just discuss like my progress and stuff. And I remember they would just sit me in there and they would talk about me like I wasn't even in the room. <clears throat> and, and they would literally just bully me in this, in this room every single month. And my parents jumped on the bandwagon and, uh, it was never a discussion of, do we want him home? It was always like, well, maybe he needs to go here. Maybe he needs to go there. And and that's just what it turned into. And uh, I got really resentful of my parents because I just felt like they weren't fighting for me at all. <clears throat> I looked at it like, why would you adopt me and then and then do this? Right. Uh, it just didn't just didn't make sense. And so at 14, I uh, I just had enough of it. And I, I chose to run away from summer school and uh they obviously found me. I was just like two blocks away at a friend's house and um, they made a huge deal out of it. And so I went to another facility. I got sent to another facility in a different in a different town. And then that's kind of where this progression started of just jumping from one facility to the next. And I ended up going to a military boot camp. Wow. And uh, that was I still have actually nightmares about that place. Um, it was very disciplined. It was screaming in your face, you know, break you down to build you up type of stuff. And uh, uh, I don't know. I I ended up graduating that program. I went back to the original group home I was in, transitioned through that, and uh, made it to foster care. And, and then I, at 15, I finally made it back to my dad's house. He was like, okay, you know, you've done all this. Uh, we'll see, and we'll bring you back. And by by the time I got out of boot camp, he kind of threw it on me. He just said, hey, by the way, um, I'm getting remarried. And I knew nothing about this. And I asked, well, who is it? And it was actually um, his old secretary. And I didn't I didn't know how I felt about it because my mother told me years ago, she said as soon as he hired her, Things were different. And so I kind of put it together. That's when the fighting started happening. <clears throat> and so I, I tried to take it, the, you know, the best way I could. Um, I, you know, I just said congratulations. And, and my brother took it really, really hard. Um, he was very withdrawn and he just did not want to be involved. And so he, my dad, you know, remarried and um, this sent my mom into another uh, spiral and uh, we all moved in together and, and um, I thought it was going to be different. You know, um, my dad seemed happy and, and things seemed good. But what ended up happening was he started putting not only his wife, but uh, his wife's son before myself and my brother. And I would hear them having conversations about, you know, they were going to kick us out as soon as we were old enough. And and. Uh, Again, I just kind of felt betrayed by that. And so I specifically remember like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to get you back. And uh, <clears throat> so I started I started stealing again and I started stealing from my stepmom. And um, one of the biggest things was I, I stole a coin collection from her. I didn't realize it was a coin collection that she did with her father who had passed away. Uh, I just took it. I broke into my dad's office. Um took all the money in there and and I just went on like a spending spree and I didn't really care because I was just so angry. 
Um, and that only lasted about two months. And my dad called the cops and I went back to the group home. And uh, I was in that group home again for maybe three days. And then the course decided they wanted to put me in a group home. Um, that was, it was two blocks away from my mom's house and it was a Mormon uh, group home. And I also had a weird thing with Mormons because my dad, um, he kind of put it in my head that Mormonism was a cult. And the weird thing is, is that my stepmom was an excommunicated Mormon. Um, and so it, it was just weird. I was like, man, you're, you're stepping all over your own morals, I guess. Um, yeah, so I was in this Mormon group home and, um, uh, I ended up staying there for two years and I was literally two blocks from my mom's house and, and. I understood that I probably couldn't go home, but I think all I really wanted was someone to fight for me and say, well, what can we do to get him home? And even if the judge would have said, absolutely not, I would have felt, I would have felt proud of my parents. Right. Um, I probably would have taken it better. And uh, this group home gave me a real messed up uh, idea of what God was. And I, it just didn't really agree with me. And, and so I started asking if I could go to a different church and uh, they would say, absolutely not. And so I would have to go to the Mormon church. And the thing I really hated about it was the second I would walk in the door, I would be bombarded with people asking me if I'm going to join. People would set up my baptism date and I, and I didn't even know what was happening. And so I just felt really bombarded with with this Mormonism and I just didn't believe what they believed. Um, but that's when I really started questioning what what do I believe? And I think I had a really hard time with with God and the God concept because because of my father. And, and I say that because, you know, we refer to him as our heavenly father and my idea of a father was really messed up um so i just didn't have a connection to that it didn't make sense to me i was like if he's this loving father and he created my father then why is my father not being a good father <laughs> um and so i i just struggled with with god period and uh so i was in this group home for two years and uh i I started getting in trouble and that's when I started messing with, uh, with alcohol and I got caught with, with some alcohol and, um, I was 17. So they sent me off to another facility. So I went to this facility in Cheyenne and it was a juvenile prison. And this was my first experience with, uh, actual criminals, uh, Did you to prison juvenile for murderers. Alcohol? They sent you to prison. Yeah. For, so, um, yeah. So, when you're in the system as a juvenile, it goes off of what your social worker wants. Um, and so I was just, since I got caught with the alcohol, they they were like, "Oh, this is a violation," and so it, obviously you're not doing what you need to at this facility. So we're going to try harder facility. Oh, this and, is so uh, wrong. That's what. Oh, happened. this is so wrong. But that is very wrong. yeah, yeah. And and I tell I tell people today the stuff that happened to us in the group home at that time. It would never pass today. I mean, they did super illegal things. Like uh, they used to wake us up with freezing uh, water from the creek out back, and there'd be ice in it, and they used to dump it on us like in the mornings, and. They had us uh, sitting on the, the highway. We had to line up our chairs and, and sit on the side of the highway for embarrassment. Um, there was just a lot of stuff that, you know, you couldn't what year do What was that? Um, this was, let's see, I was 12. So this was late 90s, early 2000. Yeah, late 90s, I think. 
And this was at um, the group home that you went yeah, back to. This was the group home. Yes. And yeah. they're the ones that um, sent you on to prison. Yeah. 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 So I, I ended up in this juvenile prison at 17. And uh, it was where I met, you know, juvenile murderers, rapists. Um, and it was like a lockdown facility. So this was my first experience in that. Um, being from Powell, Wyoming, I, I wasn't experienced with inside politics, uh, gangs, um, anything like that. And once I was thrown in that environment again, I didn't know where I stood because I was Asian. There were no other Asians, so I had to kind of roll by myself. And um, so this was an adjustment, having to stand on my own feet um, and experiencing these things. And, and so, yeah, so so I was there for a year. Um, I, I did fairly well. I just kept my head down and, and I, and I tried to get through it. And, uh, I ended up aging out of the juvenile system at 18. And so, um, I went back to Powell and I remember my dad giving me $500. Um, he bought me a, a cheap car and he said, you know, good luck. And I, obviously I was, I was grateful that, you know, he did that, but at the same time, Nobody had taught me anything in the juvenile system. I didn't know how to pay rent. I didn't know how to put bills in my name. I didn't know how to save money. I knew nothing. And I I moved to uh, Absorkey, Montana. I just drove and, and met a friend there. And, and it was a really small town in Montana. And I couldn't get a job, partly because my record as a juvenile now, was wasn't was that really expunged bad. at 18 no no oh, they did really? not expunge it wow yeah they didn't expunge it they told me they were going to and they didn't and so it followed me uh, and then just um, drinking is what you went was incarcerated for for heaven's sakes yes yeah yep and i couldn't get a job in this town um and so all i decided to do was with my 500 bucks was i just started buying booze and, and marijuana and so my friend and i we just partied the entire year um and, and that's when my addiction i didn't realize i had an addictive personality but that's when it really started taking over and so i was drinking every day blackout drunk um driving on black ice to go get a little bag of marijuana i mean just putting people in danger period and so obviously that didn't work very well. We ran out of money and I had to go back to Powell. <clears throat> and when I got back to Powell, that's when I had my first experience with methamphetamine. Um, I felt like a complete failure at that point. I had nowhere to go. So I got high with a friend and uh, stayed up for maybe three days. And in, in my delusion, I guess, I was like, you know what? It would be a great idea to go rob uh, the, the old house that I robbed when I was 12. Because I remember, you know, when I was 12, there was money there. And, and in my, my mind, I was like, there's probably still money there. And so I went, I, I don't remember a lot, but I do remember I drove out there. It was like 11 in the, you know, in the morning. Uh, I ended up parking in someone's front yard, walk over to their house and no one's there. And I break a window out and, uh, I'm in their house looking around. Obviously the money's not there. And then I just sit there and like, I don't really know what's going on, but then the owners come in and they see me there. And obviously like, I'm not in my right state of mind. And uh, I just take off um, and they call the cops and and I get arrested uh, shortly after. And so now I am 18 years old and almost 19 and I catch my first felony as an adult. And so I was charged with burglary and I'm in jail now for, for the first time. And uh, 
again, um, I'm little, I'm the only Asian guy there. And so I just get bullied just nonstop. Um, I called my parents and they were like, well, we're not going to help you with anything. Uh, I said, that's fine. And I had to fight this case. And so I stayed in jail for three months fighting this case. And, and they finally decided to let me out on probation, five years of probation. And, and uh, they let me out of jail. <clears throat> So I get out of jail and uh, I don't have anywhere to go. Um, again, I still have no skills. By this time, it had hit the front front page newspaper. And so I tried finding work and no one would hire me. And had you graduated so I high did school? what I knew. No, they, my junior year was when I got sent off to the juvenile prison. And so I wasn't allowed to graduate. Um, they just, I ended up getting a GED instead. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I don't really know what to do. So I get an apartment with a friend and I started stealing, uh, medication from my great aunt because I knew that I could sell it. And I do have to say my great aunt, she was, she was the one person in my family that, that really took me under her wing. Um, and she's such a great lady. Um, but she took me under her wing and, and, uh, she, she helped me out financially and, and really showed me what like love was. And so I bonded to her very, very quickly. Uh, but I was also stealing money and medication from her. And so I was selling that. And that's when I started getting hooked on on painkillers. And I also started doing methamphetamine again. And the, the addiction for me is... I mean, it just takes over everything. And I don't know, they say some of it's hereditary. They say some of it is just, you know, your brain. And I don't know exactly what it is, but I just hook on to things that make me feel good. And so obviously I'm you're trying totally to support this lost. habit of selling. Sounds yes. like you're totally yes, lost. Very... Like yeah. throughout your whole childhood. After that yeah. first good year, I mean. Yeah. I uh, I just didn't have any sense of belonging anywhere. And this whole time, I'm looking at God like, why would you do this to me? You know, why would you have me come to the United States for a better life? And this is what I get. And so I had a lot of, I was, uh, you know, I felt like a victim, really. And and I blamed everybody. And I blamed God. And, and uh so I just turned to the drugs because that's the only thing that made me feel somewhat better. And so one one night in particular, um, um, I'm getting high on methamphetamines with a friend. And I don't I don't know what happened, but I'd been up for a few days and I just would hear this voice in my head saying, you should do the rest of this meth right now. And. In my state of mind, I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And so I lined up, I don't know, three grams or so, and I just started snorting it. And uh, I didn't get anywhere near it. I didn't barely touch it. And I lifted my head up and I just fell out. I passed out and I went into a seizure. <clears throat> and so I'm convulsing on the floor and my friend comes and helps me and and I snap out of it and I think by this time I I really think that I, I was close to death because I, I I couldn't breathe I kept trying to catch a breath and I just could not catch a breath and my heartbeat on methamphetamine usually it jumps up to a rapid rate and mine was very very slow and I was very sleepy and I noticed uh, immediately there was like this black figure um, and it was just, it was just following me like everywhere that I went. 
Um, and I ended up in my friend's apartment laying on her couch. And I, I look, I look to the left and I can see into her kitchen. She has these beads, like these beads curtain uh, hanging down. And I can see this black figure right behind those beads. And immediately I knew, I was like, this is death. This is, this is just waiting for me. And uh, so I look up at the ceiling I'm trying to catch a breath and finally I just can't, I just can't breathe anymore. And that's when I have my out of body experience. I immediately notice I'm up at the ceiling. I could literally touch the ceiling with my hand if I wanted to. And I could breathe and I felt like a new person. And so I, I kind of lift my head up to look forward as I'm laying, laying back and the room isn't the room anymore. It's, it, it looks like I'm, I'm like in the sky, like elevated in the sky. And there's tons of, of these rolling clouds. And I see these two golden gates, um, massive. Uh, they were closed though. They weren't open or anything. And I was like, this is, this has got to be heaven. And the one thing that I did notice was I just felt and tons of people say this, and this is why I resonated with it was they say that they feel unconditional love. And so that's what I felt. I felt like this was the first time that I've ever been loved completely in my entire life. And so I was like, I'm at the entrance of heaven. But then that's when I realized I was dead. And the second I realized that I was dead, I, I slammed back into my body. And it was just, it wasn't like a gentle placement. Like I slammed back into it and I, I sat up off the couch and uh, I'm just in a panic. And I think when that happened, it opened the veil to, to something else. Um, the one thing I noticed immediately was that black shadow was still there. And so I ran down to my apartment and uh, I remember looking in each individual room in my apartment with the lights off and every room I could see an entity in it uh, clear as day. And the one that really uh, freaked me out was I was going by my bathroom and I look in my bathroom and I see this man and he's looking in the mirror of the bathroom and he's tearing pieces of his face off and I'm watching this and then he looks at me and he's, he's screaming and I can tell he's screaming at me and he's just tearing flesh off his face and so I, I, I mean that was terrifying so I ran I I didn't know what to do but I had a little a little personal bible in my bedroom and I didn't I just felt like that is what I needed so I grab it I put it in my back pocket and I run outside. And the second I run outside, it's it's nighttime at this point. I look in the sky and there's a black or not a black, a, a very white uh, bat. And he's flying figure eights and I can see his face and he's staring at me as he's flying these figure eights. So I can see the trail of an eight in the sky, basically. And I didn't understand at all what that meant. Um, but now I, I realized that, you know, the figure eight is in, it's infinity and it's forever. And so I feel like that's what it was telling me was like, this is hell and this is forever. And I, uh, my friend called the ambulance at that point. I, I fell out again on the front yard and, uh, the ambulance came and, and I had to go to the hospital for a few days. To recover <clears throat> was it a drug and, overdose um, it it was but the the weird thing is and this is one thing that uh it'll relate to my story later is that methamphetamine overdose i had never heard of that before and that's one thing that you don't really hear about at all like i've had a lot of friends die and usually if you overdose on methamphetamine you just go to sleep um but I've never heard of anyone dying from it. And 
they just said that I I overamped myself basically, and uh, I just needed to get it all out of my system. And so, uh, yeah, so I didn't believe it was a methamphetamine overdose at the time. <clears throat> um, so I don't. I, at this time, I don't tell my parents anything. They know absolutely nothing. I didn't want them to know that I was a drug addict. Um, I didn't want more reason for them to be able to hold something against me. And so I kept them in the dark for a very long time. And uh, after this experience, you would think that, you know, that'd be scary enough for me to, to be like, whoa, you know, this is too much. But it didn't. It uh, It fueled my addiction more. And even after that experience, being a logical thinker, I tried to say that what I saw was a hallucination. Um, you know, people that don't have faith, it seems like a contradiction because it takes more faith to believe that there's not something there than it does to actually believe something is there because you have to logically think about why this happened and you have to think about every scenario and it's a lot of work. But I, that's what I did. And uh, I put God on the back burner again. And uh, so my addiction progressed and I started getting into opiates. Which is uh, this was the starting of the painkiller epidemic. Um, and those things, you just get addicted so fast and your body just craves it and it withdraws from it. And people will do anything to get those drugs. And so I started getting into these businesses where people were robbing pharmacies. And I would get large supplies of <clears throat> these painkillers. And, um, you know, I had money. I had all these pills. But I was very sick. And I was obviously selling to this small community. And so my name got out there very fast with the police. And when I was uh, 21, I uh, I decided to go to treatment. I was like, you know, I, I can't keep doing this. I, I'm going to go to treatment. And so I come to Sheridan, Wyoming, and uh, I go to a 90-day treatment center. And as much as I wanted treatment, I was not mature enough to understand what treatment was. Uh, it takes a certain level of maturity to really understand who you are as a person. And the higher power concept, I I just struggled with. And if you struggle with that, you cannot get through these steps because they are based off of a higher power principle. Sounds to me like you were and hollow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just didn't feel like I really had an existence. I was just kind of wasted space. <clears throat> Um, so I go to this treatment center and it wasn't, it wasn't a waste of time. That's when I, I kind of felt what a, a brotherhood felt like. Um, I, I got to talk about some things that, you know, with my parents that really affected me and I kind of got to put all that stuff out there. And I, I, you know, when I hit my 90 days and I graduated, I was like, man, like I'm ready. But so I, I get out of treatment, I go back to Powell and I start working for this roofing company. And before I know it, I'm being arrested at gunpoint. And I'm just like, what's going on? Like, I'm doing great. Well, they're like, we have charges from last year and that we're bringing up now on an indictment. And so they waited a year. And they waited for me to get out of treatment before they brought my charges up. And so I was being arrested for something that I did a year ago. And uh, they were very severe charges. Um, it was it was uh, eight counts, eight counts of delivery of pharmaceuticals. And so eight counts, each count is 10 years. But if you get more than two, it's an enhancement. So now each count has a maximum of 20 years. So I had eight counts of felony distribution with a max of 160 years hanging over my head. And uh, 
I was just like, this is it. I, I called my parents from jail and I said, um, hey, I, I'm probably never getting out. And I remember them just saying, well, you know, you did it to yourself. Good luck to you. And so uh, it's like, OK, whatever. So I I end up fight. I'm fighting this case now. I'm 21 years old. Um, not really had no no hope really. Just figured I would die in prison. And uh, so some months go by, and I get a I get a an offer from the DA, and it's it's a 20 to 40 year sentence. And uh, I just said absolutely not. I'm not taking it. And the risky thing with that is, is if you don't take a deal and they're ready to take you to trial and then you lose your trial, then they give you the max. So I just figured, you know, 40 years, that's a life sentence anyway. I might as well just go go big. And um, I waited a little longer. And uh, then they presented another offer and I would have to take three of those felonies <clears throat> And I would get a nine to 13 year prison sentence. And, uh, you know, I talked to some of the guys about it. And they're just like, you're, you know, you're not going to get a better deal than that. <laughs> so, so I agreed. And, at, you know, 21 years old, I took a nine to 13 year prison sentence. Um, I turned 22 in, they call it the fish tank. And that's, that's the, the first part of prison. It's like orientation before general population. And uh, so I hit, uh, it was Rollins Penitentiary in Wyoming at 22. And uh, that was a whole experience in itself. People think of Wyoming and they're just like, oh, you know, it's just rednecks. It's just whatever. Um, that is not the case for prison. And it was very, very political. It was very gang related. It, it was something, you know, that you see on TV. <laughs> um, obviously, I had no support from my family. So I was doing this on my own. And um, so uh, I'm in I'm in Rollins, basically. Um, again, I'm the only Asian guy there. Um, I hit one of the the roughest general population yards in the prison and uh i just i don't know what to do i'm just kind of keeping my head down i'm not talking to anybody um and i do this for a while but i do end up meeting some people that i become friends with that kind of take me under their wing and kind of show me the ropes because there are a lot of prison rules that people just don't know about that you know, you could just end your life over something really small. Um, so they take me under their wing, and one of them is uh he's 18 years old and he has four life sentences for you know killing two kids. And I, you know, that's when I really started seeing the severity of some of the people that were there. <clears throat> and uh I don't know. It just it just uh, hit me different, I guess, seeing these people that were younger than me, knowing they're going to spend the rest of their lives in this pod or in this this prison. And uh, so a few months go by and I'm fitting in fairly well. And then they tell me to pack up. There's overcrowding in the prison. We're going to send you out of state. And so they pack me up and I go to this private prison in uh sayer oklahoma and private prisons are they are horrible um they're contracted through different prisons in the u.s for overcrowding and so what happens is is when there's overcrowding in that state they send the extra prisoners to this private prison and so it was a i think it was a 2000 inmate prison and it was 95% California inmates. And California prisons are very different. Um, you know, people die every day in California prisons. It's super gang related, drugs everywhere. Um, it was just a scary place. 
And so I'm trying to navigate this prison system. And, and that's when I run into my first group of Asian people. And uh, they immediately point me out and they take me under their wing. And and I tell them, I, I don't want to be in, in any gangs. Like, I don't want to be involved in any of that. And they just said, that's fine. You know, we'll just protect you if anything happens. <clears throat> And so it, I got to say, it was kind of, it was kind of, um, I don't know, it was comforting, I guess, knowing there were other people like me that were in this environment. And uh, so I do about a year in Oklahoma. Um, they send me back to Rollins, Wyoming. And then within, two, uh, within a month, I get packed back out to go to Pocahontas, Virginia. <clears throat> So we drive across the U.S. and that was the worst transport because you're you're handcuffed, leg cuffed, waist cuffed, and then cuffed to your your partner next to you. And it was a three day bus ride. Um, and they didn't give us water. Uh, they barely fed us. I mean, it was it was horrible. And so I go to this prison in in Virginia, and uh, that one wasn't as bad. Um, Virginia people are a little different, so it wasn't so much gang related. And so I kind of got a break from all of that. And uh, I was there for two months and they sent me back to Wyoming. And then I did the rest of my time in a medium in a medium prison. And so I ended up doing. Oh, let me back up. So a year a year before I was to parole from prison, I I was celled up with this guy who was joining the welding program. And uh, he would joke with me and say, you know, you, sh you should join this welding program. And I said, why? There, that's that's stupid. Why would I do that? And he was like, well, you know, you, it may change your life when you get out. And at this point, I was just like, well, this is what my life is. You know, I don't care. And so we made a bet. We made a bet. And uh, if I lost, I would have to join the program. And I lost, I lost the bet. So I joined this program in the prison and it was a welding certification program. And uh, I did really good in it, actually. Uh, I was a top student and uh, I ended up teaching some of it at the end. And, and uh, that was the first time I really felt a sense of purpose and a sense of hope that I had a plan. And uh, in 2014, I I paroled home and I paroled to my mother's house. So how many years uh, were you in on that time? Eight years. I did eight, eight years. years straight. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm I'm 30. I went in at 22, 21 actually, um, counting the jail time, and so I'm 30 now, and I'm living at my mom's house. And my mom has been up and down ever since the divorce with mental illness. And she has created a, a very large wedge with all the relationships because she's just a very, she was very difficult to be around. But I did get to parole home to her house and I was grateful for that. And so I have this plan. I'm going to get a welding job and I'm going to establish my life for the first time. But then I don't understand the the culture shock of getting out after eight years. Um, when I went in, I had a flip phone and I thought it was the coolest thing to be able to look up ringtones. And I get out and there's smartphones now. I had no idea what Wi-Fi was. I didn't know what data was. I Facebook, I, I'd only heard of it. And so this culture shock it really affected me more than I thought it would. And I had a really hard time being around people. I would freak out, out when people would stand behind me. Um, the grocery store, when people would block me in, which I felt like people were blocking me in, like I would literally start kicking people's carts and uh, just getting violent because that's what I was used to. And uh, so the transition was extremely hard. And, uh, but I'm still hopeful that I'm going to get a welding job. And, and uh, 
in Powell, there's only like one welding place. And so I went down there and uh, he was like, absolutely not. It's like, I remember you. And so <laughs> that was like the biggest letdown ever because my plan was now gone. And I remember my welding instructor telling me, you will get a welding job. You will. And so like I took it at face value. And so then immediately I was upset at him for lying to me. <laughs> and and I again, I just I, I play this victim card like I'm, I'm very good at it. And I was just like the immediate victim. And, and I got very angry and. Um, I just didn't know what to do. And my parole was telling me if I didn't get a job, they were going to send me back. <clears throat> um, so I end up getting a job finally with this bean company and I'm driving forklift and it's a, it's a great job. Um, did not pay me barely anything, but it was a job. And um, things are starting to look up. The only downfall is my mom is just attacking me on a regular basis. Like I come home and she's just down my throat. Um, I'd get my paycheck. She would take most of it. <clears throat> uh, so it was just like a, a perpetuated cycle that I could never get out of. And like I was, she wanted me to move out, but then she would take my money. So then, then she would yell at me for not being able to move out. <laughs> um, I get into a relationship from uh, a lady from the past and um, we end up having a, a, a kid together and uh, I'm still on parole at the time. <clears throat> And that relationship was destined to fail because it started a very deceitful way on her side that I didn't know about. Um, but we had, we, you know, getting ready to have this child and, and I finally get off parole and I'm able to move out of my mom's house. But the transition again, it, it just, I could not get past um, the culture shock of things. And I just did not feel like a person anymore. Um, I just felt very violent. I, I felt like everyone was looking at me. Everyone wanted to hurt me. And, and so I, I just reclused pretty much. And then on top of the stress of knowing that I'm about to have a kid when I knew I was not ready, um, I did what I knew what to do. And I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I relapsed and, I start getting involved with drugs again and uh, it progressed to a point where I was actually making uh, they call it bathtub dope, but I was making methamphetamine. Um, and mind you, you know, I have a daughter coming. And the one thing I did look forward to was I had heard people say all the time that when you have a child, that's when you see God in his fullest is when you hold a baby that you created and uh they say that's the moment and so like i was i was looking forward to that i was like man the second i hold my daughter that's when i know that god is real <laughs> and when the delivery happened i remember uh being in the hospital i was there for the the birth of my daughter and i was holding her and and it sounds weird to say, but I was very I was just I was disappointed. And I was grateful that she was here, but I was disappointed that I did not have that feeling of this is God. And it was such a big letdown. I remember I handed her over and I went to the bathroom in the hospital and I got high. And, uh, I mean, I think back on that and I'm just like, man, who, who are you? I doubt but if you had anything to give, you know, nobody had gave you anything. I don't, sounds like you didn't have it to give. Yeah. Ex exactly. Exactly. I, I had a hard time connecting to my kid. Um, methamphetamine is also, I, I, I say that drug came straight from Satan himself. Um, it, it's just a drug that doesn't 
let you connect with people better. It's literally a disconnection from from God, from people, from yourself. It's like the line has been severed the second you second you do it. Our youngest so adopted have- son and his wife is on that. And, and yeah, I feel that from them. They don't care about anybody. And they lost yeah. their kids. Yes. And you don't realize the damage that you're doing until you can get clean. But in that moment, it's like you have blinders on and the only thing in focus is your next fix. No one else matters. Um, you could see a, you know, a dying infant and you just would not feel anything. And, and, and the unfortunate part is like, I, I had a hard time connecting to my kid and I thought it was postpartum. I, I wasn't sure exactly, but um it was the worst time it it could have happened because that's the bonding period. Um, And then at this time, my daughter's mom also relapsed. She was a drug addict too. And um, so we were both using very heavily and we were fighting just nonstop. And it was, it was bad. Um, She destroyed, she was one of those that would grab a TV, throw it and break it and, she destroyed my entire apartment and this would happen while my daughter was there and uh my daughter would just scream and there were lots of things that happened that my daughter should have not seen uh she shouldn't have been around and this really traumatized me um i already had a hard time respecting women in period and so after this incident incidents I, I really didn't respect women at all. Um, and so this was the cycle that just kept happening was, uh, abusive relationships. Um, my daughter was being taken to, uh, you know, other family members, which was for the best. And, uh, I would just fight with my daughter's mom and that's what we did. And. I couldn't keep my job, so I just kind of gave up on life anyway. Um, When I was 31, it was July of uh, 2016, I started getting a really sore throat. And I I didn't really think anything about it, but it just started getting progressively worse. I was was staying again at my mom's house because I'd lost my apartment at this point. And we go to the ER and they tell me I have strep throat. And so I, you know, I'm just like, all right, um, I go home a few days later, my, my strep throat was even worse. Uh, I could barely talk. I had a very high fever and, um, I went back and again, they told me it was strep throat, nothing they could do. And so a few more days go by and, uh, I remember I was trying to be out and about and I uh, went on this thing with my friend where we started doing some shake and bake meth and uh, I was really sick and my kidney started hurting. I remember when he, every time he would tell a joke or something, I would laugh. My kidneys would just, it just felt like I was getting punched in my kidneys. And um, finally I went to a different hospital and uh, they they took a, an x-ray of my kidneys, just wanted to see if there was anything there. They thought I had kidney stones or something. And in this x-ray, they caught a bottom glimpse of my, of my lung. And they saw these little dark spots. And so then they did an x-ray of my lungs. And there were multiple black spots all over. And um, they told me that we don't know exactly what this is, but it's, it's very serious. And, and I I just said, you know, I'm not going to admit myself. This is, I'll be fine. And I was getting ready to walk out and the doctor literally like begged me. He's like, please do not leave. If you leave, you will die. And I was just like, I don't feel that bad, but I, I got admitted and they, I took an ambulance to Billings, Montana, and they put me in like 
the the terminal ward like a cancer ward and so i didn't understand really what was going on and after some tests they they said that i had septic pulmonary embolism and it, it was basically blood clots that were in my lungs and my blood was septic and that's why i was so sick and they told me that they would keep me comfortable in, until I passed away. And so they, they put a pick line in my arm. Um, and I'm just thinking that I'm going to die. But I'm totally okay with it at this point. I was just like, I, I just don't care. Like, um, and you they're tried. pumping me with. <laughs> like you that? tried. You tried. Like. Life, yeah. you tried, you failed. I mean, I can see it why you feel that way. Yeah. And in not one time did I think I, I this would be a great time to to maybe pray. But again, I, I was just like, this is your fault. Uh this is the life that you had for me. Um like I don't I don't I don't want anything to do with you. And so I'm being pumped with uh, the lotted every two hours in this pick line. Um, they have me on oxycodone tens every four hours. And this is what my life is like for a month. And they thought I would pass away within that time. Um, but I didn't. I just kept getting better. And finally, the infection came out. Um, the the masses uh, broke up and... and uh, I was released from the hospital and they wrote me a prescription for, it was like 150 oxycodone fives with three refills. No, oh, no. And so I was just like, this is fantastic. Um, I went home and I got those refills and myself and my daughter's mom went through those. I mean, within probably two weeks. Um, there was one point where I was taking 40 to 50 of those a day and it, it was barely doing anything. And, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I couldn't work. Um, I thought I was rebuilding my life, but I used the sickness as an excuse to not go anywhere. And, uh, I started doctor shopping and I would purposely hurt myself so that I could get prescription painkillers. And uh, and then eventually I got red flagged at every hospital um, for doctor shopping. And uh, so my life didn't really have, I didn't, I just didn't know where to go at this point. And um, I decided I'm gonna go to treatment again. So I go back to Sheridan, Wyoming and uh, I go to this treatment, the same treatment center, but it had been rebuilt and, and uh, new administration. And, and um, it was the best thing for me. Um, I went, I, I, there was a, a program called the Christian Enhancement Program. And I put myself in it because I said, look, I don't have an understanding of God, but if I throw myself into this, maybe I will. And so, my recovery was Christian based and it was really difficult because all the questions that I had to answer were, how did God help you in this way? And I would have to lie and I'd say, Oh, God helped me do this. And I felt like a fraud, but I just was like, man, if I hear that one thing, maybe it will open my eyes. Um, it didn't, but what it did do was I was able to, to end my relationship with my daughter's mom, um, which I was terrified to do, but I was able to do that. And uh, I was able to start building a relationship with my daughter. Um, she was still, you know, a baby at that point, but I would call and she'd hear my voice. And, and um, I got a faith coach that was there and he would, he would really kind of, help me with like scripture and stuff. And the biggest thing that I got to work out was my PTSD uh, through prison. Um, that was the majority of that treatment was 
figuring that out and talking about it. And then they diagnosed me with like re reactive attachment disorder. Um, cause I have, I just have a really hard time connecting to people. <clears throat> um, so that treatment center was, it was a blessing really. It, it really was. And I graduated that program and I decided that I was going to stay in Sheridan. Um, the recovery community was really big here and I, I wanted to be a part of something. And so that's, that's what I did. And I also, this is where I messed up was I started, I got in a relationship with someone from the women's side of the treatment center. And that is the worst thing yeah. that you can do as a broken man, find a broken woman and think that two broken people are going to heal each other. Right. It, it just, you know, especially new in sobriety, it just doesn't work. And that's you need where a rock I made at that my point, mistake. don't you? You need a rock. Absolutely. Not yes, a absolutely. quick sand. Yeah, because you we were both trying to be sober, but then like she was lying about it later on. And so I felt like when I found out about it, I was like, well, if you're not going to be sober, I'm not either. And and that's that's what happened was I had a I had a welding job. I finally got my welding job in Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, the opportunities were just vast. I mean, I got every job that I ever applied for here, and uh, I had this job. But no, no, it was it was just like a little independent, um, just a small little welding shop that would take on uh, an entry level welder. Okay. But they gave me the opportunity, and and I was really grateful for that. Um, and so I started getting some welding experience. But during this time, I was also relapsing and using with this new girlfriend, and it just it just didn't work. This girlfriend ended up going to jail, and I I gave up again at that point. I was like, well, I don't want to do this. So I relapse, you know, I not only relapse, but I'm starting to sell drugs again. I quit my job and uh, I'm starting to build this new reputation in Canada. And so they tell us in treatment that, you know, your addiction is uh, it's always in the parking lot doing push ups, waiting. You know, as you get stronger in recovery, your addiction gets stronger in the parking lot. And uh, that's very true. Because every time I relapse, I pick up where I left off. And it's always worse. And that's that's what happened. Um, I got hooked back on methamphetamine. I was selling methamphetamine. I uh, was still doing opiates. And my addiction took over worse. Uh, at this point, I, I was carrying guns around. Um, I was... I was, uh, you know, assaulting people, uh, pulling my gun out. So it was just next level uh, type of stuff. And I am a, you know, seven time felon. I get caught with a gun. That's that's a wrap. So I'm I'm just living like I don't care. And uh, I eventually get held up in this uh, motel room, and um, it's kind of like this standoff. Uh, with the police and I finally barricaded myself in the bathroom and <clears throat> um, they they came in you know guns drawn and thankfully I'd, I'd gotten rid of I've gotten rid of my gun uh, a day before and uh, I got arrested and it was more charges I had more charges now um, they were felony possession charges which is like the lower felony. It held, it held a max of five years or, or something. And uh, I remember going to the jail and I had this sense of relief. I remember sitting in the, the holding cell and I, I felt like I could just breathe. And as much as I didn't like my circumstances, I didn't really care because I was like, man, the chaos is finally over. And 
I specifically remember praying this prayer and I, and I, I said to God, look, if you're real, you need to show yourself. And if you don't, I'm turning away forever. And I said, I will give you my life as of today. I will get in your word. I will pray to you. But if I don't see something change, that's it. And so I started, I started reading the Bible, um, small parts. I started reading self-help books. I, you know, really started getting into it, praying. And what really changed some, something was I got a hold of, uh, 90 minutes in heaven by Don Piper. And I read that book and it completely changed my life. Have you seen the movie? Uh, I haven't. I have it's on it's on Pure Flex. Oh really? Yeah. I'm gonna have to watch it. It I think it's the third chapter where he's describing what heaven looks like. And as I'm reading that chapter, I get an image of just like my experience when I was at Heaven's Gate. And I was like, man, this is real. Um, I'd never had a book or let alone a chapter affect me in such a way to where I was hungry for it. After that book, I read Heaven is for Real. Um, and then I just started reading all these NDEs. Um, and I was just addicted to them. I, I couldn't stop reading them. But so I'm fighting this case in jail and um, I'm praying to God. I'm like, I'm, I gave him my life. Uh, I'm starting to see, you know, small changes. And and I remember I was in lockdown in my cell and the, the guard comes by and he slides a packet under my door and it's a uh, it's legal paperwork. And it's I open it up and it's a summons and it's it's for my daughter and it's paperwork saying we want to terminate your rights, but we want to adopt her. And this was my my daughter's mom's older sister who had her wanted to adopt her. And they said, basically you have 20 days to give us a response or it goes to her by default. And after I read that, I, uh, I threw all my paperwork. I started kicking my door. Um, I, uh, I just felt helpless. It's like, I'm in jail. I don't know what to do. And after I calmed down, and I don't know if it was an audible voice or if it was just in my head, but I heard God and he said, fight and you'll win. And I, I kind of looked around because I, I had a cellmate and I was like, did you say it? He's like, what are you talking about? Um, so I knew it was God. That's and a blessing. It, yeah. And in that moment, it was like. I was given this gift. It was like a download of step-by-step step what I needed to do. And so I was like, Whoa, wow. So I, I sat down, I grab a piece of paper. I write, I write this legal statement saying that I do not uh, grant this permission. And, you know, like I'm going to fight this and I'm just like, well, what do I do next? And then it just, it hits me. It's like, you need to notarize it. I'm like, well, I'm in jail. How is that going to happen? And I just ask. So the next guard that comes in, I say, hey, will you notarize this? And he's like, absolutely. So like, you, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so I, I give it to him. I give it to him. He notarizes it. I'm just like, wow. I put it in the mail. It gets sent off. And it bought, it bought me some time. And that's what it did. Bought me some time. Um. So I'm, I'm getting ready to go to sentencing. We worked out this plea agreement to where I would do like a two to four with, with uh, time credited and all that. And I remember before I went to court, I, I wrote this letter out and I prayed over it. And I said, God, let, let my words be your words. And I went to court. And uh, as we're in court, 
the judge says, I don't think I'm going to take your plea agreement. He's like, I don't, I don't like drugs. He's like, I don't think anyone who brings 26 grams and 26 grams is not a lot, but he, he made it seem like I was like the kingpin in Sheridan. And he's like, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to let this slide. And I look at my lawyer thinking my lawyer's going to fight for me. And she doesn't, she just sits there. And so the district attorney, the person who is against me, stands up and she says, you know, Your Honor, really, how much time is, is someone on possession really supposed to get? And so I'm looking at her like, why are you fighting for me? Really? And she, yeah, she was like, Mr. Allison is a drug addict. He had ample opportunity to flush the drugs in that moment. Since he didn't, it shows that he thought in his mind that somehow through this, uh, you know, cops coming into his hotel room, that he would somehow be able to keep them. That shows that he is a drug addict. And, and so I'm just, I mean, my <laughs> mouth is open. Like, she's fighting for me. My lawyer's sitting there. And so the judge is like, well, Mr. Allison, you know, you can say something if you need to. And I, I said, okay, pull my letter out. And uh, I I was like, this isn't going to work. So I put my letter down and I start talking. And I don't know really what I said exactly, but when I finished, there was like this wind. It like brushed across everybody. And as soon as I finished, I felt it. And I look around and everyone else is looking around because they obviously feel it too. And so then I look back at the judge and he just puts his head down and he says, I'll go with your plea agreement. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a miracle. And so I'm getting walked out by, by the guard and the guard asked me, he just looks me directly in the face. He's like, what just happened? <laughs> I tell him, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but that was the, like, I really started feeling God. And he was working these things in my life. And I had a prison sentence and I was perfectly content with that. I knew I was going to prison. And, and so when I went, finally went to prison, it was different. Um, I had already established myself from the prior prison sentence. So people weren't messing with me. Um, I told people specifically, I'm not going to be involved in your politics. I'm going to do my own thing. And that's what it's going to be. And they said, I respect you for that. And they left me alone. Um, I went to a minimum camp. And it was the best place to be if you're incarcerated. Um, and that's where I did my time. And that's when I had my court case for the adoption of my daughter. And I remember the Kate, the trial was, it was about three hours. My daughter's mom was in prison too. She called in from prison and she testified against me. Uh, they said I was dangerous. They said that it was a mistake to let me have any kind of legal right. And I left that hearing feeling absolutely defeated. And, and um, I called my dad. And at this point, my dad and I had started rekindling some things through the works of my faith coach from the treatment center. They happened to know each other. And so we started talking and my dad just told me, you know, um, yeah, you lost. Definitely lost. And so a few months go by and I get the letter. I get the answer from the judge. And. She said that I, I'm not terminating your rights. I'm not allowing this adoption. And so basically I won, I won that case. And it brought me straight back to God's, God's answer. I mean, he said, if I fight, I'll win. Did the mother so, of your child, did she get hers terminated? Did she voluntarily no, give up? No, so that was, no, so that's the unfortunate part in my eyes was like when this first happened and the summons went about, she signed 
a thing saying that she was terminating her rights and giving the, the adoption to her older sister. And she had signed it. And they wanted me to sign it as well. So I refused to sign it. And since I fought for my rights and I won, she got to keep her rights too. Oh. And I was I was very upset about that. Um so I win this, I win this case, and by this time I'm fully convinced that God's on my side. And I'm just, man, I'm just like, I feel I'm starting to feel complete as a person. Um, the prison sentence, it goes by, I do three years in prison and it went by fairly fast to me because I was constantly in God's word. I was reading tons of books, just trying to help, help myself and uh, parole came and I wanted to parole back to the treatment center. My faith coach was telling me, just come back, we'll help you. And so that's what I did. And I paroled back to the treatment center in Sheridan, Wyoming, and I completed a two month program and I got out and I really felt like I had it this time. I was like, man, like my whole perspective is different. And uh, I just feel more mature. I understood the steps this time because I had the higher power and so I'm going to these uh, these meetings, um, these support meetings, and and I'm doing everything. And <clears throat> um, I have a job at the YMCA in the weight room, and um, I'm not making much money, but I'm just really content making you know doing this job. And I'm doing this for a while, and uh, I don't know I don't know what happened. To be honest with you, I. I met up with a friend and uh, I, I end up relapsing. And uh, it, it, did, it wasn't immediate. It wasn't like an immediate downslide. I like relapsed and I felt bad about it. And I, I stopped for a while and I was like, you know, I'm going to change jobs and, and, uh, you know, see if I can't get this welding career on track. And, and so I call this company and, um, it so happens they were hiring welders and they took me on immediately. It was a, it was a very great job. You know, I still work for them actually today. Um, but they took me on and, <clears throat> and, uh, thinking that that's going to get me back on track. And, uh, it doesn't, the addiction side is, my addiction side it's very powerful it's it's like once you feed it it just you just can't stop and i was using again uh started out with methamphetamine and i started noticing this time that not only was it affecting me in a, in a negative way it was affecting my mental health and that was when i really started noticing like anything to do with my mental health can you answer and, me something? I'm confused. Uh, yeah. When people are in prison, they're not able to do drugs. Usually I me mean, understand in California, you said there's a lot of drugs, but, but like you went three years, yes. I take it without drugs. Yes. Yeah. There. So the first time I was in prison, there were drugs and I did, I did get involved in drugs. There was heroin. That's when I started doing heroin a little bit was in Oklahoma um, but the, when I did the three years, drugs are harder to get into like the, the minimum facilities. And the only thing that was really available was they call it spice. And it's just like a imitation marijuana. Uh, it, it's just a gross, it's a gross high. Um, and that was the only thing that was around and. It, it it was around, it was offered to me, but I just, but I just made the decision at that point. I wasn't going to indulge myself in that. And uh, so I didn't. And so that was the longest I really had of any kind of clean time, really, um, was that. But 
so as I'm out, I'm, I'm doing this welding job and they're really taking me on, but I, I've relapsed. I'm doing methamphetamine. My mental health is, is really in a, a bad place. And I start doing some heroin and that that's where my addiction is, is I, I am more of an opiate heroin addict. And the thing with heroin, especially in Wyoming, is, is that it's not readily available. I mean, it's starting like the epidemic has been around for a while, but it's it's coming into Wyoming. It's It hasn't been here like in abundance for a long time. Um, so it was hard to find. And I had a fentanyl uh, connection. And the thing with fentanyl is that the way it is being distributed is it's being pressed into other pills. So what looks like an oxycodone 30 is actually a full pill of fentanyl or a Xanax bar is fentanyl. And that's what these cartels are doing are they are pressing fentanyl pills to look like something else um, to, to hide it better. Um, and that's why a lot of people are dying, it, you know, like people at parties, you know, they're like, oh, well, this is a Percocet and they take it. They take one or two thinking it's a Percocet and one can kill you. And that's where this epidemic is, is like these fentanyl pills are just being distributed and they're and they're cheap and they're available and it's just taking over. But I was actively seeking fentanyl because i knew that it was a very strong substance and that it would really mess me up so i was seeking these things and that's what i was doing for a while was i was getting fentanyl and i'd come back and i'd just do it all and i've never thrown up so much in my life i've never fallen asleep so much in my life uh and that's the weird high is like you do it and you fall asleep and Somehow that's fun. So as this progress, uh, my life is is regressing dramatically. I'm having I'm falling asleep at work. Um, I'm literally falling asleep standing up, and I'm welding, and uh, I'm just welding a mess. It's a, it's me it's a mess. Um, they start noticing. I'm on parole, and I'm using. And uh, one time, and, and this is this is where it kind of gets a little controversial, I guess. Um, a buddy, he was he was a close friend to me, and uh, he chipped in some money with me. And he says, you know, I'll let let's go get some fentanyl. And so I, I said, okay. And uh, I took his money, and I went and got some fentanyl, and I came back, and I go to his house. And I give him half <clears throat> and we, we get high that night. And I remember we're getting high and uh, it's him and, and his girlfriend and, and myself. And he, he was one of those guys that he did things to the extreme. Um, he didn't do things to get high. He did things to, to be on a, a cusp of, of death. Like that was fun to him. And I remember he did one of these pills and uh, we were IV users. I should say that we were IV users and uh, it hits you different when you're an IV user. And he does one of these pills and, and uh, he stands up and he's just completely out. Like he, he's, he's waddling around. He can't barely talk. He's falling asleep, standing up. And so like, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm like, Hey, like, you know calm down with these You're like you need to respect this drug it is dangerous and uh you know he he comes out of it eventually and i leave and i go home and the next day i'm i'm out doing my thing you know selling these pills and and i text my buddy and i'm like hey you know just checking on you seeing if you're okay uh, i don't hear anything and I, I message him a couple more times, call him, go straight to voicemail. And as I'm driving, I get a phone call from somebody that <clears throat> we're mutual friends. And, and, and she's like, hey, 
um, your friend, your friend Wyatt died. And I didn't, I didn't really process it. Um, I drove home and I, I just, I just couldn't process it. I, I wasn't sure if I was dreaming. I, I, it just didn't seem real. And so I had to call people to confirm. And, uh, sure enough, he, you know, he, he died. And this was November, November 1st, um, that he was pronounced brain dead and, and he died. And so I didn't, I didn't take it well. That's, that's one of those things. How, how are you supposed to, uh, how are you supposed to respond? How are you supposed to process that? I felt like I killed my friend. He died of the and fentanyl gig. The well, I'll I'll kind of get into it here. Uh, so, as I'm trying to process this, I I contact my friend's girlfriend. And all I can say is, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I didn't know this was going to happen. Um, and I wasn't sure what to expect, I guess. Um, she didn't, she wasn't showing, uh, anger towards me. Um, she was obviously a wreck, but I took it on as this was my fault, um, I led to his death. I killed him. And so I get called into probation, parole, and uh, I fail a UA for fentanyl. And my PO asked me, you know, like, hey, like, where are you? This is dangerous. Like, didn't you know someone just died from this? And I panic. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I know it's killing people. I, I don't know. And, uh, you know, he takes my phone. Uh, by this point, I just did, I, I didn't know what to do. Uh, they took my phone, they made copies of it. They gave me a sanction and they're, they're just like, we don't know what we're going to do with you yet. And I, I just told them, just send me back to prison. At this point, I didn't care. Just send me back. Um, but he refused. He said, no, no, that'd be too easy. And so I left and I I'm just at this point, I am suicidal because of the, the guilt that I have. And one night I, I take, it was, it was a handful. It was probably over 30, over 30 of my anxiety, uh, my, uh, depression meds. And thankfully I told a friend before that I was considering it. And, uh, I, I took them all and, uh, I must've fell asleep or something, but I, when I woke up, um, I was, I was very, very upset. I was so angry and I was angry because I felt like a failure in my life, but I felt like I could not even kill myself correctly. <clears throat> and before I could even think of another way to do it, I get a knock on the door and it's the police. And so my friend had called the police for a welfare check. And the police came in and they, they talked to me and I, and I told them, I don't, I don't want to live. So, well, they're like, okay, we'll come with us to the hospital. And I ended up getting admitted uh, to the psych ward at the hospital. And I'm telling, you know, the doctors and what's going on. And, and I start getting violent with, uh, with the doctors and, and I'm threatening nurses and, and, I'm, I'm just out of my mind at this point. And 
I get sedated and uh, I fall asleep. And so when I come to from that, I don't know exactly what happened, but I, I just felt like this isn't where I'm supposed to be. This isn't God's plan for me. And it was, it was Thanksgiving, it was Thanksgiving day of uh, 2021. And I just felt different, I guess. Um, the doctor had put me on uh, a new medication and I felt different immediately. Um, and it's a management medication for addiction. And so they released me. They said, you know, okay, I think you're okay. And I, and I said, I think I'm okay too. And so right after that, I, uh, I went to a, uh, a meeting. It was a 12 step group meeting. And uh, I started getting plugged in with that. And I remember going to these meetings and like, I couldn't even keep it together. Uh, I'd walk in. Uh, the second someone would talk, I, I would just, I would break down. And I, I don't know what that was exactly, but it, it was just like a, a pulling on my heart, I guess that, you know, this, this is the life that I'm supposed to have. And, and someone said something in a meeting that really made a lot of sense. And it kind of changed my, my whole perspective. And, and this person became my sponsor for a little bit, but she said something like addiction is like a broken toe or recovery is like a broken toe. Because when you break your toe, it really hurts. And you go to the doctor and there's nothing they can do for a broken toe. It's just broken. You just got to give it time. And she made the analogy of like, you start walking on it and it, it just hurts and you're limping. And then as, as the weeks go by, you start walking normal and it doesn't hurt as bad. And then before you know it, it doesn't hurt at all. And you realize that, Hey, it, like, when did my toe heal? And when she had made that analogy about recovery, like, again, it made so much sense. I just broke down in the meeting. It, it, it just, I don't know. It was like the one thing I needed to hear um, that just changed uh, recovery in general. And so I'm starting to to do the step work with the sponsor, I'm going to these meetings. I have a significant other that is also in recovery who has been in recovery for a while. And uh, she's really helping me, you know, with this uh, unconditional love. And at the same time, I'm talking to my deceased friend's uh, girlfriend who is now starting the recovery process and she's like i'm going to decide to start going to these meetings and i'm going to start taking it seriously and so i'm watching her in her recovery i'm watching my recovery and i'm looking at my significant other's recovery and and i'm just seeing like this miracle happen and um in the back of my mind i'm also concerned about my friend's death because I was, I was worried that it was going to come back on me somehow. Um, and we were kind of waiting on the death certificate to see what the death certificate said. And, uh, myself and, and my friend's girlfriend, we were just praying on it. Like, you know, what's going to happen with all this. And, and she got the death a certificate and it said that he died of a methamphetamine overdose and that it was accidental and so that's why when i said i had never heard of anyone dying from a methamphetamine overdose never had heard of that and what that did so they was, can die of it then right yeah yeah yes 
Um, but you said it was fentanyl, though, right? But that's not what he died of. Yeah. Of the fentanyl, it was of the meth. Okay. Yeah. And so that's where I was like, I didn't understand it. Um, and, and I've said this before, and this is where some of the, you know, I knew telling this story would be a little controversial in some areas because some people were like, is it really a miracle that you avoided that? And I guess my answer was, I don't, I don't know if that was a miracle. And, and I, I had a hard time accepting that that was a miracle. Um, because in some sense I did contribute. Absolutely. But he didn't die of that. He died. Of, he must've took meth on his own as well yeah. as the fentanyl. And yeah. And that's what I think it was. It was a mix of fentanyl with methamphetamine. Um, and I, I, I had a hard time taking it as a miracle and I wasn't sure how to feel about it, honestly. Um, like you thought you didn't deserve but it a basically, miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I had to come to the realization is yes, I, I played a key factor in, in the addiction aspect, but he made the ultimate choice. I didn't force him to do that. And that was the only way I was able to kind of forgive myself in a sense. And his girlfriend actually said that she, she's like, I, I forgive you. She's like, that wasn't, you did not put the needle in his arm and do it for him. He made a conscious decision to do that. And basically uh, and when you play with fire, it. you're going to get burned, I guess. Exactly. I look at, I look at my friend's death as it, it was a sad moment for me and uh, very, I felt very guilty about it. And today I look at it like his sacrifice gave me my life because if he wouldn't have died, I would have died. And then he probably still would have died later. Um, a thing that happened was I was going to a meeting and I'd been clean for about a month and I was starting to, you know, take my training wheels off in recovery. And, uh, I remember it was a Wednesday night. Uh, I, I get paid on Wednesdays and earlier that day, one of my deceased friends connects fentanyl connects messaged me and said, Hey, uh, I have a great deal on these fentanyl, uh, fentanyl pills. And he's like, uh, I can give you a great deal on them. And in my sick mind, I was like, Oh, well, this works great. I'm getting paid today. Like I could probably shoot down and, and do that. And so I was really considering this and I go to this meeting um, and I'm listening to it and I'm just kind of not really paying attention. And as I'm leaving the meeting, this, this uh, woman comes to me and she says, Hey, and I don't know her very well. And she says, Hey, I need to, I need to talk to you really quick uh, before you leave. And I said, okay. And so we're by my car and she says, this is going to sound very weird, but your friend, your friend came to me in a dream. And he said that you will be given an opportunity to, to go get some fentanyl. And he said, if you, if you do that, you're going to die. And I, I just looked at her and my, my, my mouth was open. I, I was like, you don't understand what you just said and how it relates to what's going on today. And so I showed her the message of this guy uh, telling me that he's going to sell me these. And, and she was like, that's your warning. And, and I was questioning about where my friend was because he did not believe in God. And I, my, my constant everyday struggle was, is he okay? But it kind of confirms some things. If he's in a place to where he can give me a warning, then 
I feel like he's in the right place. And I took that warning to heart. And so I, I didn't answer that person who was offering these things. And um, I just kept moving forward and I, I didn't, I just didn't look back. I believe that my friend, he, comes to me in science. It, it is amazing the science that I get. And, I, and I'm a big person on science. I do not believe in coincidence. But I, I constantly see things. And the biggest miracle I see is just not only how my life has progressed in the way that it has, but how his, his girlfriend's life has progressed. And uh, I've been, I've been clean now for about 14 months. Um, I'm very involved in, in, uh, in this 12 step meeting. Um, and I, I go back to the treatment center that I've been to so many times. I go back to there, uh, and I talk to the, the inpatient guys. And now I'm that person that's, uh, speaking to them and they're asking me questions on how did you do it? Um, I have a, a great relationship with my daughter. Uh, I, I see her as much as possible. She doesn't live with me, but uh, she I see her a lot. She'll be seven hmm. in January, or yeah, this month. <laughs> She'll be seven. Uh, you know, we have a great relationship. And, and uh, uh, my mom, you know, my parents and I, we've kind of mended things. Uh, now my dad and I, we have a great relationship. My mom, she was diagnosed with vascular dementia a few years back. And uh, she just couldn't live at home anymore. She lived in Powell. And uh, she had a power of attorney that was a friend of hers that was misusing uh her power i think she was misusing funds and i caught on to it immediately and so i convinced my mom to to move to sheridan and i took over power of attorney um i have her in assisted living and uh you know now i'm i'm taking care of of that stuff um that relationship i can say it, it's it's the best it can be. It, she is not only suffering with mental illness, but with dementia and people with dementia are, it, it's an up and down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I've had to quit trying to focus on rebuilding the relationship and just focus on what's best for my mother. Mm -hmm. um, I'm that for my sister. She has those things too. And I'm her power returning. She's in yeah. nursing home. Yeah. They're and like it's your child. hard too with my absolutely and that and it's weird how it, it changed um and there's a lot of trauma that i have with my mom and i had a hard time letting that stuff go um and i was trying to rebuild the relationship based off of that and it wasn't working and uh i just had to come to the conclusion that you know regardless of rebuilding it which i probably won't be able to in this lifetime um i can at least take care of her essential needs and i owe that to god i owe that to the 12-step program i owe that to my friend um the life that i live is a reflection that celebrates my friend's life i feel like it's through me that he gets to live and uh, that's what keeps me motivated every day. I don't want to go back to that. And I don't want to disappoint him. And um, I just have too much to live for. And so, like, all of this is, is God. And so when I compared my life to footprints in the sand and, you know, living life forward and understanding it backwards, I can do that today. And when I tell this story and I look back on it, all those times that I felt alone, I felt abused, I felt like I didn't matter, those were the times that I was being carried by God. I think sometimes our NDEs change our life, but it might not be right away. 
It might be decades. Absolutely. I didn't know how to tell that story. It's been, I mean, it happened when I was 18. I didn't understand it until recently. And you know, hearing God's think, voice and given steps, um, I was given that uh, the year, I was 17, the summer of before going to my senior year. I was uh, walking out in the field and I just started praying to God, I need help. And I come from an abusive background and I knew I'd be kicked out at 18 and I would have nothing. And, and all of a sudden I, I felt this wind and I knew God was there and I felt his presence just surrounding me. And I was given steps like you were. That this is what you need to do. You need to um, get your driver's license. You need to start working. You need to save for a car. You know, da da da. And I did those. I need to get over an old boyfriend. I was suicidal over, and and so I just called him up and you know started a relationship, and then we ended it in mutual terms. And I was over that, and it's able to go forward. And you know, um, so I was kicked out at eighteen, but I had already had a job, and I was you know able to save money to get. Sent three hundred dollars and got a car. It was big enough to be homeless in, and I was okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Thank God for that voice that comes and rescues us. And I say I think sometimes us orphans or us abused kids, I think God has a special place in His heart for us because we get those miracles. I, I believe that very much. You know, God. You know, that's the people that he cares for i don't want to say the most but people that don't really need god they don't reach out to him the way that we do um you know it says come come to the lord you know with all your heart and uh i felt like that's what i did and uh, i had to be broken down first and mm -hmm. um and that's the thing with drug addicts is you know they always say wait till you hit your bottom well what happens is is that we like to redecorate our bottom instead of it being our worst. We like to redecorate it to make it livable. And, and that's what I've done, but it had to cut. Unfortunately, it had to, it, there had to be a death um, that was very close to me in order for me to see the bigger picture. And, and uh, I've had a lot of friends die. A lot of friends die in this world. And this was the one that really hit me the hardest. And, um, I wish it didn't happen the way it did, but I'm grateful that, you know, it led me to, to where I'm at today. I, I just feel like God can use you now. You know what it's like. Those people coming in those meetings, you know what it's like. You've been through it all. Yeah. yeah. And you can be that rock yeah. for someone that nobody was a rock for you. And you know what it's like to go through life without love and without having somebody being a rock and you you were in yeah. a perfect place to do that yeah yes so do you think yeah. you'll write a book someday i don't i honestly i i've been like hearing in my heart like you need to do something um whether that's fighting this drug epidemic whether it's i don't know i don't know exactly but i've had in my significant other keeps saying like you're gonna write a book but i'm just like i don't know where to start with that i tell you what you do uh, what i did as um one day as the vision just come and everything just like come together and made sense i realized that I was throwing all the miracles, this you know, the NDE spiritual experiences under the rug with the abuse, just the same. I was used to covering things up, burying and burying and burying. There's nobody wanted to hear these things. These weren't things they make a talk about. Right. And so it just come to me that I had to bring it all out, both the good and the bad, so people could appreciate the good, to see what I went through and to how these miracles, just like you, how they affected your life. And, and yeah. it just, it just, I think when the timing's right. And so I just grabbed my laptop and I started writing on it stuff for three months. And I was just going to put it away in a drawer and tell my kids, give this to my grandkids when I die. I thought they'd be older then, you know, and then, mm -hmm. but God has a plan. Things, you know, just fell in place. Someone come approached me and said, 
why don't you send your book to my publisher? Because she knew I showed it to her just in this binder. And I just had like a magic marker and wrote this title on the front. That was all it was going to be. I was hugging it. It's like, this is my baby. And then I was on a Saturday, Monday, she emails me and she says, send that to my publisher. I'm like, no way. I mean, like, you don't understand. I'm not good at sentence structure and spelling and all those things is really hard for me. Even though I graduated from college, it, stuff was really hard. It was so personal. And so I called him and he was a formal yep. monk, former monk. And, he, and I said, I don't think it's worthy. And he said, it's worthy because you're worthy. And something about him saying that and being a former monk, I think, added the credibility to it. And it just healed me. Like like on the spot, someone to say, you're worthy. And so, I mean, I encourage people to do it because there's a, I mean, you could, you know, write it and send it out to, you know, in uh, to prisons everywhere, you know, yeah. get coffee at prisons and, you know, let people know what you've been through. And, um, and I was surprised because mine is so female, you know, the first half's about being abused as a child. And then the second half, right. you know, becoming a young mother and domestic violence and working in child protection. And, uh, and I was surprised that what they call, I didn't know the word term, but target audience end up being middle-aged men. That was writing to me and oh, said wow. they couldn't stop crying. And I never thought that middle-aged men, men at all, would read my book. But it was middle-aged men that was touching. You know, they were reading about sexual abuse. And yeah, all that kind of stuff. And then they said they couldn't stop crying. So, yeah, I think you really have, a, like, you know, you have something to share. You have something to give. And, and you're wondering how to get it out there. But and uh, so I seen you on another podcast and I wanted to have you on because I really I like your story. I know it's heartache. Like people tell me, too. Oh, I like your story. Right. OK, well, that's all child abuse. This is the torture that it was in my life. But it's the redemption. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love the redemption story. Yeah. And I think, you know, other people can say, well, gee, I thought I was through gone through too much that I could never find my way on the other end. I think they hear stories like ours, like, well, maybe I can, too. Maybe, maybe because I've heard so many times on these podcasts that the people, they've been through everything and they get to that point and say, God, if you're real. You need to show yourself to me now or forget it, you know, and something yeah. happens every time it does. God listens. Yes. It does. And, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that's so square, you know. Well, try it. <laughs> because yes. when nothing else seems to work, there's that. And that's a lot of times it works for a lot of people. So and then, yeah. as you know, then you hang on to it. It's your anchor. You know, that, that you'll never give up this relationship again because of the gratitude. Absolutely. And I understand the reactive detachment. I was guessing before you said that, that that's what you had and PTSD, you know, because of the, the, I have that problem too. I don't like people looking over my shoulder. You were talking about that earlier. Like yeah. I can't do it. Like even my husband, I trust my husband, but I still, I cannot have him looking over my shoulder. I don't care if I'm doing dishes, I'm cooking, or I'm sitting right here. Nobody can look over my shoulder. I just can't. Right. Um, one thing that I'm doing that I've finally been able to kind of come to a place in my life where I can look at it is uh, my girlfriend and I, we, we got an Ancestry.com kit. And uh, I've been putting this off for very very long time um i was very angry at my real parents and uh you know now that i'm you know 37 and uh i'm starting to become curious about certain things and so i'm waiting i'm waiting on you know we're close to finding out exactly and i'm not really hopeful that there's going to be anything um i've heard stories where people that are adopted from korea they they see absolutely nothing. Um, and that could be the case. But I, I just thought, it, you know, it, it's worth a shot. I'm at a Are place those where records I think sealed? I can... Are those records it, you're not The, the adoption anything? was. Yeah, it was a closed adoption. I don't even know who my parents were. I don't know their names. I, I just know what my name was. And unfortunately, the last name is as common as Smith. So it... it 
but I'm ready to kind of close the chapter, I guess, on like, will I get an answer? I, I don't know. But if I do, I'm willing to accept whatever whatever answer I get and then just move forward. Yeah, it matters. It does. It matters. Yeah. And, you know, we adopted children, too. But, you know, when they turned 18, they went to the biological and they got them on drugs and um, oh. taught them how to steal and all those things. But that's mom and that's dad and that's grandma and grandpa and that's your aunts and uncles and your cousins. They they need that. Even if it's about, you know, we can give them everything here. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They, they need that blood. You know, they were made fun in school yeah. for being adopted and, and, and they want that real family, no matter what it is. And I know even with my mom, I mean, like, she's just like a horribly mean person. And, you know, I kept going back to see her, going back to see her, you know, hoping there's something there and there's nothing there, you know, and, and some people do find that out when they find their biological that maybe they, I mean, I've heard of mean things. Some biological was said to, you know, and, um, yeah. but then there's also the wonderful reunions too. So I, um, yeah. I'll pray for you that you find some answers. Uh, thank you. And I, and I pray that you make that 14 months, 14 years and, Keep on going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So is there anything else you'd like to add or? Uh, I mean, like I said, uh, the redemption story is just, uh, these ones just, I don't know, they, they're really encouraging and, and, you know, people that are struggling with, with God, it's, I just want to tell them, man, like he is, he is there. He is absolutely with you, uh, whether you see it or not. I mean, when that moment comes, when you do see it, you will see that he was there the entire time. And uh, it's just, it's, it's been life changing. I mean, I'm so grateful for the life that I have today. Yeah. Um, this uh, tapestry I have here is amazing grace. And it's always been my favorite him, you know, or, you know, saved a wretch like me. And, yes. you know, because so many people think God wouldn't want nothing to do with me. I've done so many bad things or whatever, but you know, that one yeah. lost sheep, he'll go to ends of the earth for ends of, ends of the earth. Yeah, so. absolutely. So thank you so much. It's been nice talking thank to you. you. And uh, I'll email you as soon as this is ready, probably by morning. Okay. 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 All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.